Hello, hello. Welcome to another edition of the Law Firm Blueprint. I'm one of your hosts, Jay Ruane, and with me, as always, is my man, Seth Price, over there. But we are joined by somebody extra special today down there, and that is our friend. sound so wrong. <laughs> our friend from Florida wearing that wonderful Hawaiian shirt, which is really the first time I ever, I ever got to know you was walking around the halls of a conference. I said, oh, there's Jordan, because he's got the Hawaiian shirt on. Jordan Ostroff you know? is with us today. Uh, to talk about his new book. Um, and uh, Jordan, thanks for being with us uh, for this uh, episode of The Law Firm Blueprint. No, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. So the reason why I uh, wanted to bring you on, and I talked to Seth about it, and it was a no-brainer for us, was that you know, you've uh, really sort of carved out a niche in the legal entrepreneur space. You, you're, you've done it, right? You, you've built the law firm that gives you the life that you want, um, which I think is is rare, um, in our um, extended audience group, I guess you could say, there's a lot of people who are trying to emulate what you've been able to achieve. Uh, and I think, you know, um, the message of your book, I, I got to read most of it uh, before we did this taping, um, really sort of resonated with me because um, as something you said before we started the show, uh, a lot of people um, need to plan on what they're retiring to, not what they're retiring from. You know, and 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 happiness is 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 critical and key. So, tell me about your inspiration as to why you decided to uh, take the time because writing a book, as Seth and I know, is not something that uh, goes easily. Why did you yeah. take the time to, to to do this? So, I'm I'm really lucky. Um, I've had so many people who have given me their honest advice and help. You know, the two of you in this call, as well as other people. Um, I started out as a prosecutor, so when I left to go do criminal defense had like 30 attorneys who were willing to sit down with me and walk me through the change to being a defense attorney and the things to consider and all those. And I was too stupid to ask them business questions, right? Like I was concerned about being a lawyer. And so I started out as a business owner. I started generating a ton of referrals, having no idea what I wanted. And I managed to turn that into $200,000 in debt and 80 hour work weeks and being completely miserable for three years. Um, and so I really want to help more people avoid some of those pitfalls I made and capitalize on some of the good decisions I made and, you know, have gotten myself through it so that we can have more lawyers that can genuinely with an honest face tell people that they're happy to own a law firm. They're happy to be a lawyer. They're happy to, you know, they have a great life. That's what I'm hoping for. So let me ask you this, because this is something that uh, is near and dear to my heart. And obviously it's to yours as well. How did you, you know, where what was that moment of clarity where you were like, I can't do this for another 30, 40, 50 years. I need to make some changes because I think a lot of people in our audience and a lot of our colleagues, they just kind of put their head down and, and start working and they may not be able to um, voice their misery or even uh, be willing to admit that changes need to be made because they say, well, this is just the life that I've chosen, like they said in The Godfather. And, uh, and so they, they don't know that there's, a different way. What was that crystallizing moment for you where you said, I, I got to make changes? So I wish I could tell you the exact day. And for some reason, I did not write it down. But my kid was born on March 2nd of 2018. So when my wife told me she was pregnant, that's the moment. So like mid 2017, I was sitting at our breakfast bar, having dinner, my wife had uh, took one of my hot sauce containers and then changed the label to like, you're going to be the hot daddy or something like that. It was very funny. And I thank God I was happy about it. Like we had been trying for over a year. It was like that nice, you know, 15 seconds of happiness. And then literally I went into like, how the fuck are we going to do this? We are $200,000 in debt. We are working 80 hours a week. We are miserable. We are drowning in a sea of fire. And now someone's about to hand us a baby. And like, that was the moment for me that I was like, there's no way that we can go down this path. And so, you know, I cut a $130,000 marketing budget. I was like, look, at least we'll get fewer cases. I'll have more time to be a parent. My firm made $5,000 less, not to say the marketing was that bad, just to say we like naturally grew into it. And that was like the breathing room to really go back to, I would say the basics, but I guess I never started with the basics. So to really have the time to figure out the basics. And like, that's what the book's designed to help people do is get those foundational things in place. So Jordan, did you start and pivot or did you build the firm with those foundations in place? No, no, no. I completely asked backwards my way into like a 15 person law firm. I came up to Orlando to go to UCF. I stayed here for Barry. I was a prosecutor here. So I generated like a couple hundred thousand dollars in referrals and was like, this is great. 
I'll hire a marketing company. It'll be awesome. So I did that. And then I had slightly more cases. So I hired a lawyer. So I hired more, mar so I did more marketing, more lawyers, often a second office, all this stuff. And then like at some point realized I wasn't making any money. It was going out just as fast as it was coming in. And I was grinding and grinding and grinding, trying to work my way through. And so it finally made me realize three years later, the stuff I did that I enjoyed, the cases, you know, the cases I really wanted, the clients I really wanted, and then recreating everything around that ideal client model, around having a firm that was going to support the life I wanted, around, you know, every, that kind of stuff. And I guess when I when I look at this, because I've known you for for a while and, and sort of saw you in a lot of ways, you know, like similar interests, right? You like the marketing side, you like the you like the legal side. I it, it felt as an outsider, like you knew what you needed comfortably. And that you weren't going to grind to get that number exponentially higher, but rather you were going to do it on your own terms where you basically were creating an operation that gave you the freedom. And as if you put a dollar figure on that and were good with something less than what Jordan was capable, is you would have figured out profitability. Even if you looked up, woke up and said, yeah, I got 15 people are not as profitable as I want. You could have figured that out, but instead said, okay, I'm not going to figure that out. I'm going to instead figure out how to make this something that I really enjoy and know that whatever number I'm coming up with is one that I'm good with. Um, prob I mean, that would be like, that's like 2019, 2020, Jordan, 2015, 2016, 2017, Jordan had no fucking clue. Understood. About anything. You figured out this profitability and you're like, okay, you could either maximize that number or you could maximize life while understanding that I know you and I know you would be capable of getting a much larger number if that was your sole goal. Oh, thank you. Yeah, probably. I mean, that's like the story my accountant and I have all the time. He's like, you are the least profitable by percentage law firm owner that I know. And I'm like, thank you, because I don't work Tuesdays and Fridays. So it makes sense that we're, you know, 10, 15 percent less profitable than somebody who's grinding 60 hours a week. We just well, hired right. so an you extra person. Not you have your own number, but what Jay and I talk a lot about is we talk about redundancy on the last show, but more that if you replace yourself, which at some level you would, you not only don't have somebody who's you doing it, which would theoretically be possibly, depending on the situation, at a higher level than somebody else, but more buy-in, more skills, maybe, maybe not, but you also have when you're do when you do that type of a, a play, you have the cost of that person. Right. So that uh, by definition, profitability is gone because you've taken that profit and you said, hey, I'm not going to do this work. I'm paying somebody else to do it. And as long as you're good with it, it's great. But it's a it's a it's a it's a conscious trade off. Yes. And you and in my experience, I can find people who will do those things better than I could and will do them more consistently and will do them and and free me up to go play golf and generate more cases who so will free me up to spend more time making higher level business decisions who will free me up to do an extra couple hours of training with different staff members to build up their skills, which then becomes exponential impact. You know, it's interesting that your accountant would say to you that you're, you know, Oh, you're, you, you know, you're not a profitable business compared to other ones because they're looking strictly at black and white numbers as being profit. But I think, Part of the message of your book, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that profit can be measured in a lot of different ways. And one of the best measurements of profit is wh where's your happiness quotient, right? Like, you know, because if you're making a million dollars in, you know, net income a year um, after taxes, but you hate your life, is it really worth the million dollars? Um when you can make a half a million dollars and be ecstatic every day. Um, you know, so I, I think, and that's, and, and, I, and I know it's difficult when people are first hanging a, a shingle and they're, you know, and, and they're scraping by, right. They're, they're, you know, they are, Hey, you know, this week I'm putting my gas on my credit card because next week I have a fee that's going to come in. That's going to be, allow me to pay it off, but they don't have the cash in hand. And, and I'm not trying taking away from any of the people in, in those shoes. Cause but the good thing is, is that as lawyers, we can, you know, ideally accelerate that process and get the profitability. I think part of your message, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you have to define what profit is to you. And for you, Jordan, profit is picking up your kid at school, being able to go play golf and being able to have the, that time 
to actually enjoy your life now versus waiting for some mythical day when you're going to now get to turn on the enjoyment. Right. Am I wrong? Well, I mean, I would switch profit for success. Like we are I, a profitable I, I, I was firm. Great. I was, I was, I was tracking you with that, which is, yeah. it's not because, because it is, look, it's a difference in profit objectively, but it's a question of, do, are you good with less, you know, re- money, cash in hand? And that, and that sort of seems to be the trade-off that you're making in your mind. Um, yeah, probably. I mean, so like, ultimately it's a question of, you know, at a, 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 the million dollar firm, just because the math is easier. If you are a solo practitioner at a million dollar firm, you can have a 90% profit margin, do everything, have a VA, whatever else. For us, you know, we probably look at that as more of like a 25, 30% profit margin, but I'm not working Tuesdays and Fridays and I'm leaving at two o'clock on Wednesday and I'm, you know, and I'm going to golf on Thursdays for a couple hours. And, and a lot of that generates work back and, you know, I'm lucky my family and I did the 13 month cross country road trip and I'll have memories that will never be replaced while the firm had, you know, our best, our biggest year up to that date. It was just, it was crazy to me, you know, like we individually are not scalable. We can create scalable businesses through systems and technology and hiring people. But so often, I mean, and I'm, I'm guilty of this for so long was like, I'm the best at everything. So I can't delegate this. So I can't hire somebody else. So I, you know, I've got to do this. And next thing you know, there's only 168 hours in a week and you're miserable and you're dropping balls and everything's on fire and you're triaging everything. You know, it's just, it's and, crazy and you know, what's fascinating about this because Jay, you know, Jay, we talk a lot in the last few episodes about Jay parachuting in when somebody quits, things like that, that to a certain extent, and there are a lot of sort of these coaches out there in the legal space that talk about this concept, which is if you create something where you're not essential, it's worth so much more than when you, when it is like if Jay is the linchpin and he can't leave the firm without it falling apart because the next guy who leaves cases are going to be dropped and it's it's a, a shit show and, and it's not set up for that the firm is not worth anything to the outside world whatever that means doesn't you know most lawyers never sell their firm so it's moot but right. it's it's worth if, if Jay could literally take himself out and have a head of operations that's sophisticated enough and a and a head trial or head lawyer that could do things where he literally could leave for a month. When there are a lot of coaching gurus that talk about this, but you sort of have lived it, not in a negative way, but like in the sense of like, this is what I want. You're not retrofitting. I and mean, you sort of did, but like you've created this methodically rather than saying I'm miserable and I'm going to change it. It, it appears as somebody today, I don't know if the if that change was really painful or if you just started slotting in labor and said, okay, I'm good with that lesser percentage of my account and won't be happy with me. I mean, we had, we had no profitability and 15 people and I was still working 60 hours. And so it was, you know, the easiest thing for me was cutting back on the whole marketing budget. And then that lowered the nut we had to cover and that lowered the cases. And so now I wasn't spending so much time following up with some of these bad leads because we didn't have an intake system in place at the time. And so we could go back in and rebuild those things. Like it was just, I, I don't know. It's tough to tell you the specifics of it because I created this, I created this Cthulhu tentacled monster and then had to slowly slay it piece by piece to get back to the law firm I actually wanted. So what's your current makeup? How many lawyers do you have? So right now we've got two and then we've got some of councils and some co-councils on stuff like that. Um, and I'll be honest, I have never tried a PI case. That's what we are. We are 95% that now. I have never opened a file. I have never picked it up. I would not be able to handle any of those things, but I can market. I can make business decisions. I can hire people that go through those things and I can leave, not come in on Tuesdays and Fridays and leave at two on Wednesdays. And No, so of your two lawyers, that does not include you or your wife. No, so my wife's a lawyer as well. So she, she I would say she's the criminal side partner. or PI side or both. So there, I mean, at this point, there is no criminal side. So she's the managing partner for the PI side, and then, like I said, you know, we've got um, some other of counsels and whatnot from there. And then there's the pot of you know legal assistant, paralegal, intake, marketing person, and whatnot from there. And it's exactly what we want currently. It's great. That's awesome. That, that really is fantastic. And I, I think it's interesting that you talked about this many tentacle beast that you had created. I think what happens when you get into this growth mode early on and you don't have a conscious plan of where you're going, you kind of just start bolting on stuff 
because now you've got more leads coming in and now you got to pay for more leads because you got more people. And so you haven't made this conscious decision of how you want to grow. So I think you did something that was somewhat unique and you said, stop, wait a minute, let's actually figure out what we want to be and grow that way rather than just take the growth as it comes and figure out how to make that work. Um, and right. I, think I mean, that, I never figured out how to make it work. And I don't so... know. I mean, it's 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 interesting to me. You talk in your book a little bit about uh, referrals, and we were talking offline about uh, how um, you know developing referrals is an important part of every business. I think in today's modern world. There is so much of a reliance on digital marketing. I'll do respect to Seth at, at Blue Shark. Um, but, you know, traditionally lawyers have gotten their referrals uh, and have gotten them through it. And, and with the new breed of lawyer going all in on digital, I think there's sort of a vacuum of referral opportunities. And, and the, the lawyers that step into really cultivating that, putting time, attention, and money into referrals are going to reap some rewards because other people are happy to not bother because referrals do take time and take effort. Um, it's not like, you know, you just put, plunk down a credit card uh, and, you, you know, you get some LSA leads coming in. The relationship isn't isn't built, but it's, it's, it's fee for service, right? You're getting the lead for X amount of dollars, whereas with referrals, it's actually about developing lifelong relationships, right? Certainly. And, and the other thing is like, look, on day one, you can go to that lunch, you can go to the happy hour, you can do whatever. Like the problem that I had, and, and this is, I listen, I did not use Blue Shark. This is not to Seth. Seth is way, that's why I'm here. He's not this kind of person. Would happily take like 200 bucks a month for me, do a $150 management fee and run $50 worth of ads. And then I'm sitting here wondering why nothing worked. So like, it's this interesting concept where you almost have to like build enough of a nest egg to do digital marketing the right way, to have the time, to have the energy, to have the structure, to be able to pay for people to do things correctly. I mean, it, it's what you just said, I, I I see more often, we don't talk about it on the show that much, but it, it's the most frustrating thing because there is a world of SEO, which is under 2000 a month, where people do stuff and they take money and it's just very, very hard. You, like you can't, if you, if you do the math, you're running a business, you know, you're going to take a 20, maybe you take less, 20 something percent profit margin. You pay your employees, you do these different things. How much resources are left based on what you're paying to do anything? Right. So if it's $500 a month, like, you know, there, there is limited things that can be done ethically that are going to move the needle. And that it's it is one of those discussions, and we talk. I talk a lot about historically. Until you get to like four hundred thousand in revenue, you really don't have the corpus of of stuff. You need to sort of hustle with you know this and that, but that it is very very hard to spend meaningful money to get over that. To to to, and that there are tricks and things you can do to get there, but it's likely not a heavy digital spend because you just don't unless you're independently wealthy or have a loan or something like that where you're going to do it, you don't have the resources. You're going to drain the business. And Jay always scratches his head and says, why don't more lawyers have a business plan when they start with capital set aside? And they just don't. A lot of people, I, 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 I want to have a well, show. I mean, I didn't. To be fair, you had your dad and that's not nothing. I know there were issues. I know that, but you, there was a, there was a roadmap. I had an empty desk. Yeah, I had a desk, desk and you got, we got histories written by the victor. We started at a time when stuff was exploding. You could do pay-per-click then make a lot of mistakes and still make money at 50 cents a click. What it was a DUI click now cost in, in, in your market. I'm I'm spending a couple hundred dollars. What it was one click. What's one. Uh, yesterday it was 138 for a DUI lawyer. For a click. For, for a click. Right. So the, when you started, it was 50 cents. That didn't keep no, no, no. My first click for Connecticut DUI lawyer, I can look it up on my ad account. November 11th, 2002, cost me two cents. Two cents. Right. And so the, so the guy who started all today, you, doesn't, have that, doesn't have that benefit. I assure you, Orlando injury lawyer is not at that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the Morgan main office is a couple of golf shots away from me. No. Right. Well, so and, and look, hold on. We're talking about marketing. To anybody listening to this, there's a whole component of sales that we are not talking about now that also costs money, that also takes time. So a thousand percent to what Seth said, plus being able to follow up with 30 leads, you know, if they do click, if they do come in, 
it's it's crazy. Yeah, it's 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 kind of crazy to me because like we talk about how lucky I was to come around in the late 90s as the internet was taking off and I had first mover advantage and the the costs involved in doing that stuff were time and a, a small spend compared to what it is now. I think it would be ridiculously expensive to try to launch a, pr a practice now and try to compete with a Morgan or a Jordan or a Seth on any of these uh, platforms because I would need to have capital to be able to go into the digital marketing or take that money and do it in referral. And I think there's more opportunity for growth right now in referral marketing. Um, it also depends who you are. Like to well, that's the thing. I, 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 I'm, Jordan I, can walk into any room and be best friends with a guy by the end, right? That's that's not all like, the shirt. <laughs> not everybody has that in their DNA, and I think that that's one of those things that, like, if you take a roadmap and say everybody should do this, that's part of the problem with the gurus is that it doesn't it, it's you have to know what your skill set is, what the environment is. Look, your tort laws, despite the changes, are still amazing compared to the nonsense I'm you dealing keep, with. You keep so putting me that. a flag down in Florida. Right. You mint money until you get the pimp. I mean, it was like it was so many different ways to make a buck as long as you were out there. Whereas here, if you if you're playing the referral game, you got the same number of referrals. You're squeezing a lot less juice out of those oranges. So some of right. it's situational and you don't know. You just happen to like Florida. It's a good place. You got Disney or nearby. Right. And, and, and so it, it worked well. You know, whereas, you know, some of this is we don't know what we don't know until all of a sudden you're there and you're like, oh, well, I'm making money. I could do this. I guarantee you the same formula that you're following here would not work as well in other jurisdictions necessarily, because, you know, I see places like in Georgia where it might work really well because there are dozen, dozens and hundreds of doctors that refer stuff in. And it's a whole system set up. If you're in an area that doesn't have that, that that interpersonal is not going to work as well. Well, and that's why. So. You know, part of the thing I have in the book is like, do you actually want to be a firm owner? You know, I think like that's a thing. There's so many of these Facebook groups where it's like, you got to go on your own, you got on your own. And I'm like, uh, if you look at Clio Trends, that average solo attorney is making $55,000 a year with $200,000 in debt. Um, and then, yeah, for me, I always go back to ideal client. And I don't even care what kind of work you do. Who do you want to work with? Because if you figure out the people that you vibe with on the client side, you will figure out how to get in front of them. You will figure out how to speak to them. You will figure out who else they go to. So like I've always, I mean, my criminal defense clients and my personal injury clients are almost the same people. And I love helping these people in society that have been shat on for their entire lives. I prefer PI where they don't have to be the one to pay me. And so then it becomes like, you know, how do we, how do we speak that lingo? How do we stand out? And then who else are they going to go to? You know, how are they going to their neighbor for help? How are they going to a doctor's office? And you know, you can take that along the lines of any, you'll get a different answer, but you can ask the same questions across the board. So I think, I mean, for me, at least, you know, in, 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 into this conversation and, and reading the book and, and stuff, it's, it's a lot of lawyers, you know, run head first into being an entrepreneur because they figure there's more money out there or the money at least is mine. The hours are mine. But I think part of your message really is, slow down, buddy, slow down, friend, and actually be purposeful and decide what you want and then go after that. And maybe, and this is a conversation that I actually had with somebody in our community probably two years ago. And I said, you know, all the things that you're lamenting to me about, maybe you just aren't cut out to be an entrepreneur. Maybe you would be a really great trial lawyer at a firm and, you know, the response I got was, well, I want to run my time. I don't, I want to be able to take right. seven weeks of vacation a year. I said, right. But are you really taking seven weeks of vacation a year if you're, well, no, because I'm running around like a madman trying to, and, you know, and close sitting on the time. beach with my laptop doing, follow, putting out all these fires. But, Dude, but exactly. look, and, look, yeah. and look I, I love the fact you've created what you created, but you also spent a bunch of time figuring shit out, even if it was break even during that yeah. time, hopefully not losing money, you built something, you hustled, you grinded, and then you're like, okay, now I sort of get the game and I'm going to go and put this plan in place for this. I think that when you hear people like, hey, you got to immediately go to five weeks vacation. Is there something wrong? This is the issue that I have. I see with the Gen Zers, particularly Blue Shark, where the, the, the hustle environment is not there, right? We, I sort of, Jay and I talk about this, where it's a nine to five, nine to six mentality. It's not nights and weekends. It's not grind. Can I tell you my, favorite, my recent business. story? 
I'm sorry? So a, a doctor friend of mine hires a front desk person, like literally this was three or four weeks ago, who in the interview says, I'm only going to do 75% of the work you give me. And my buddy thought this was the most hilariously funny joke that anybody had ever shared. Three days in, realized, nope, actually they were dead serious. So gave them for every four tasks, they did three of them. So they uh, they didn't finish the week, but we all appreciate their honesty. Right. And, and look, they, let, let, let's get away from so give them 125 percent of work. No, 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 this sure. is, I'm, talk, I'm talking about people that are able bodied. They're not they're They're doing everything. Yeah. Their, their world is going to be nine to six. And look, they work more efficiently. They're more you know, they got more focused than my now aged ADHD brain. Like all those things are amazing. But you did things. How many years was it of this sort of build up before you said, hey, I had the epiphany, I'm going to make a change? So it was about three years. Right. That's not nothing, right? Yeah, if I you agree. started from day one with this lifestyle piece, would that have been as successful? Or did you learn lessons, see what worked and what didn't work, understood how, like, just the, the chain, the selection of people that you were going to do? Because by going on your cross country trip, you don't want to have that moment where somebody's like, hey, I gave my notice and sent choice letters to all the clients and, you know, good luck when you come back. I mean, right. there are things that you figured out that look three years amazing it was that little time but that it's part of that journey and that to me when you're younger and willing to grind i don't i think that that's a benefit that you learn different skill sets and you figure out what worked so that you did something by choice sure. at the end but i don't i could you have done that from day one um, I mean, I don't think from day one, but my hope is a 170 page book might save somebody six months of aggravation. It might save somebody a year of aggravation or give them you know, a whatever. So that they're thinking about it for when they want to get there. Right. But if you didn't put your head down and do it, I, and again, it is taking exactly. away from the book. I am sure yeah. it, people are going to get a lot out of it. But the idea is that there are certain skill sets that I genuinely believe generally come like from grinding. And you see the big firms are struggling with this. As people go virtual and you're like a first year who normally learns and is mentored from the older lawyers, right? That's their whole model is to scale up. How do you get that serendipity time at six o'clock, seven o'clock when everybody else is gone, when you're talking and figuring stuff out together, that doesn't, I mean, now the Gen Z that is working with this, they know how to leverage Zoom and meetings and technology in a way, but generally for the older school people, there was a huge benefit, I think still is, from that in-person stuff that you do lose online and that you better find a way to supplement that or know that it's not there and find some other benefit from the digital connection you wouldn't have otherwise. And I yeah, think, well, you know, the firms that are going to be successful are going to figure out how to put those into place now right. so they're not losing people and their lawyers are getting better. I mean, one of the best things that we've done in my firm this year is we've moved my father um, to a mentor role. He's coach and his, he's the legal coach. And so just today, two of the lawyers, you know, popped into his office, uh, one on a meet and one on in person and just said, hey, I want to workshop this case with you. I've, I've got some questions. He's loving it. They're loving it. Um, and I think that really works. And so if you can put that into your systems and make that not necessarily, um, you know, happenstance, but more regular, I think you're going to have a firm that's going to be able to succeed uh, and survive. Jordan, you had a point you want to make. I don't know what it was anymore. You guys are great. <laughs> so I love, I always love listening to the banter. I think it's nice to be part of it. I mean, the reality is, is Seth and I, like, I, you know, I think Seth and we can, we'll talk about this. You always had a plan to scale your firm to the size that you are, right? I mean, you, you didn't see yourself being in a small five lawyer shop. You wanted a big show, right? Is that fair to say? Seth? I'm here. Oh, did you? Uh, you always wanted oh, to have oh, a big show. I was like, yeah, no, no, no. 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 I, no I mean, yes and no. I, I You see that because you see me now. No, I back in the day, I wanted to pay off some real estate debt. Um, you know, we, we, we built a website. It took off. It hit fire. It was the right place, right time. I wanted a business. I walked the franchise floor. I was the accidental law firm owner. Like I, my law partner wanted to practice law. I didn't. I was looking at like ice cream franchise roll-ups or something like that. And he's like, no, I want to do this. So I, I, I love the digital side and was able to run a business that happened to be law. But it was, it was not that like, I knew that this was good. Like, when we started, there was nobody doing this. Nobody scaled a firm before. I mean, I say nobody, but like, there, it took years not to find other people. Space. Yeah, especially outside of PI. 
And even yeah. then, it was not the same as PI as it is today. Jordan, I don't know about you, but I'm really interested in the Seth and Jerry ice cream brand. I would love to get some Rocky Road oh. from Seth Price handing me over an ice cream cone. There we go. I but you know what it was the year I looked at the franchise. It was the marble slab. It was the cold stone. It was all. It was high labor. And I didn't know. I didn't know it was a fad. But I what I knew was it was a pain in the ass to do each thing. And I remember. I'm going to digress. When I got married, right, we spent our money on a venue and a band and everything else we went like, you know, cheap on. Meaning we found a person, we rented the vases and she brought the flowers and put them in and picked up the vases at the end of the night. And instead of having a fancy wedding cake, I was in a New York wedding where it was like a $100 a slice. We did a Cold Stone cake. And I remember going, the one thing I was allowed to do for the wedding, couldn't register for anything, wasn't allowed to choose anything. I was sent Sunday morning at like 9 a.m. to meet the Cold Stone cake design lady who asked if it was okay in our $25 cake if she could buy a special $10 tin for it. I'm like, yeah, that's fine in our budget. So, but while I was there, the Cold Stone lady was, it was auditioning 12 high school kids to work in the store. And I just realized what an incredible, I mean, we talk very often that it's an HR game, what we do at our level, hiring the staff, keeping them in place. And to see this lady doing, I'm like, I, life's too short. I can't, I couldn't do this. Imagine, I, I don't want to discipline my own kids. Imagine I have to deal with like 12 kids that hoping that some of them are going to show up to work. Well, and now you have a ice cream bot, you know, can resolve some of the HR issues. Right. And at least it's a, it's a more expensive widget. It's not a, eight dollar cup of ice cream but instead it's you know back then it was a two dollar cup of ice cream you're old no 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 <laughs> I'm talking about cold, the, these marble slab things that raise the bar that's what the point is it was, was more just... expensive it was just i'd rather sell the two dollar one where it's a scoop and not have to go through a 15 minute show to produce your cup of ice cream yeah gotcha. i want ice cream i'm getting ice cream tonight guys there we go I'm, if you take awesome. nothing away from this, everybody, go buy exactly. ice cream. Exactly. If, if you take nothing else. Okay, so let's. Let, I want to digress then. So, Seth, you're at Cold Stone. What are you getting mixed into your ice cream? What What is your go-to? Well, like, Jordan, got, co cookie dough is, my, is, the, is, the, is the staple. Well, okay. we can take a lot of different stuff depending on mood, right? There might there might be some, uh, you know, all, all different, uh, you know, crunchy if you're in the mood, non-crunchy. I get that. But to me, the fundamental is cookie dough mixed into the base. If you, that that sort of chain that 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 is my staple. Okay, so that's the question I have for you. So you mix it up and get different things at the ice cream place, well, or are the, you the, the kind the of person? Truth, I'm not going cold stone draw out of business. It. The whole business model is gone, so it's moot. Uh, I am too frugal with the kids. I'm the guy at the boardwalk, right? Where where it's five dollars a scoop, five fifty for two, or six dollars for three. That with my three kids, I'm like, we'll take three scoops, and can I have two extra cups, please? So I, you know, I've just arbitraged seven bucks versus fifteen. Kids hate me because like, oh, there's a little bit of that flavor. I'm like, tough kids. We just saved eight bucks. You're not you're not uh, having it any other way. Oh my god, Jordan, what's your ice cream of choice when you go? Um. So I'm I'm definitely like a cookie peanut butter chocolate. So something Reese's Oreo cookie dough that's probably in like a cake batter bottom. It's probably my. You know I'm a guy. I love chocolate chip cookies, but I hate cookie dough ice cream. I am straight vanilla with chocolate chips and some Reese's peanut butter cups, and I'm good. And I will get that every time without fail. There no, I'm not. I'm not taking chances with anything. You know, it's the same. I, I, you know, I, I get anxiety thinking about having to mix up my order. But uh, that's good stuff here. I mean, this this has been a, this has been a good show. I, you know, I think we've gotten a lot out of it. I mean, the 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 takeaway from me from from your book really besides is, the ice cream. Besides, well, besides the ice cream. The, oh, I'm I'm absolutely getting out of here and going to get ice cream. I hope my wife isn't listening to the show because she'll yell at me for having ice cream. Um, not without her because she won't eat it. But the fact that I, you know, I still bigger than I should be and I shouldn't be eating ice cream on a Thursday at, at you know, at four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, but I think the takeaway really comes down to you need to be intentional and you shouldn't just put your head down and, and expect to pick it up in 40 years and then, and then get to retire. Like, you know, it's better that you enjoy your life at 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 than wait to enjoy it um, nonstop at 70. I mean, I, I, my mantra has been, I'd rather, you know, retire two years later, but take a month off, uh, you know, every year for two years, for, for 10 years and be able to have that 10 years back to me in little chunks. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I mean, the, the only thing I'd add is be intentional for you, you know, look back to what Seth said, if, you know, if you get terrified sitting down for lunch with somebody, great, don't do a bunch of networking lunches, like do the things that make sense for you that are intentionally what you want, not what some asshole in law school thinks they you want from them, not what you feel indebted to somebody else for, but like be a little selfish in a good way. And look, there's there's benefits and like by grinding, I travel well. You know, there's nothing. I'm mean, saying I miss the travel that I would have done if I had done this incrementally rather than sort of grinded and then travel. Not that I didn't travel before, but that there is something to like what you're doing where you're traveling with a, with a kid. It's not easy. It it is it is not for the faint of heart. But it's an experience unlike, you know, later in school where it's fixed three vacations potentially a year. What, you know, Christmas break now has become so absurd as a time to travel dollar wise, at least table stakes are triple, you know, any other time of year. And it's going beyond. It's that crazy that you're then limited. So the idea that you took advantage of a time when you didn't have to deal with school, um, to me, I applaud um, and there are things I was ballsy about during COVID. We went and remote worked from Florida and had like a mini vacation for four months while working. Jay saw me at the Tiki Hut every day. At the same time, um, you know, to be able to pull that off, uh, big, big, uh, big props to you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so, so Jordan, okay. So for all the people in the audience, uh, tell us the name of your book and where people can get it because this is going to be released and your book is going to be out in the wild. We want to get some pre-orders out there. So let's make sure that everybody knows uh, how they can get your book. Thanks, man. So it's called Love Your Law Firm by Jordan Ostroff. I've never written a book before. Probably never That's write one again. We'll title. see how it goes. Thank you. I, I, I put money. You'll have another book coming. Well, thank you. I mean, listen, if all your listeners buy a copy, I'll have another book at some point. But um, it's on Amazon. You can order it. It'll be, uh, it'll be free the first week on Kindle. It'll be discounted on Amazon the first week. Comes out April 1st, not an April Fool's joke. But for my entire life, I wanted to announce a real pregnancy on April 1st. But my kid was born on March 2nd, so we never had that opportunity. And uh, we're we're one and done with kids. So I'm I'm doing the book on April 1st, but it's real. But it's, it's another I'm... baby of yours. You know, it's something that you put your heart and sweat it's... into. So I mean, my kid's six, and I think the book started before he was born. So... But it's just now coming out as he's well, graduating. Congratulations as uh, two co-authors. I, I did not realize what a cool experience it was to drop a book. Uh, people, uh, you know, look at you differently. And really, I think uh, I hope it's, a, a you know, a great, great experience that furthers the, uh, the journey you've been on. Thanks, man. Awesome. Jordan, thank you so much for being with us today, folks. That's going to do it for us this week on the Law Firm Blueprint. Of course, you can always catch us and take us on the go wherever you get your podcast. Just search up the Law Firm Blueprint podcast and give us a five-star review when you do that. Of course, you can catch us live in the Law Firm Facebook group, Law Firm Blueprint Facebook group, live every Thursday, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. Pacific. God, I'm tongue-tied today. It's I'm thinking ice cream. Yeah, I'm, there I'm go. Really, guys, I'm really thinking ice cream. So. Uh, it's 28 degrees, by the way, when I woke up this morning and took my dog out and I'm about to go out and get some ice cream. I got to get down to Florida with you, Jordan. I can't take this cold anymore. But folks, that's going to do it for us here this week. Thank you so much for being with us. Bye for now.